Yeah, so we'll continue. Um, we'll get into cha John chapter 7. But before that, just to dwell upon a few verses uh, in the previous chapter, um, if we could have someone read out for us from John chapter 6, verses 43 up to um, verse 47. John chapter 6, verses 43 to 47. Do not murmur among, among your yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone can see the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Over here, Jesus makes a point. Um, just because the people of Capernaum have watched Jesus grow up from childhood, it doesn't necessarily have to make it impossible for them to believe in his divinity. Because anyone whose ears are open to the voice of the Father will be able to believe in their hearts this truth. So Jesus makes a very important point over here. He says, um, no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And then he says, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So it was not actually an impossibility for people to believe in him just because they have watched him, you know, grow up from childhood. Uh, so that need not stand in the way of their believing. Rather, it is the hardness of their hearts which was preventing these local people from believing in Jesus. They were not open to what the uh, father was trying to teach them. If they had been open to what the father was saying to them, they would have definitely come to Jesus. Uh, so, which is why it, uh, you know, Jesus says in verse um, 45, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. So um, it was the hardness of these people's hearts which prevented them from trusting in the Lord. Uh, the reason that I'm bringing up this point is that along with these local people, even Jesus' own family members also, you know, had grown up uh, with him. I mean, his, his half-brothers, they also had grown up uh, with Jesus and had seen him, you know, reach adulthood. And so they were having the same struggle which the local people were having. Why? Because in their hearts, they were not open to what the Father was saying. They were not learning from the Father. Because Jesus says, if they learn from the Father, they will come to me. So we will look at uh, chapter 7, the first few verses, uh, which talk about the attitude of the brothers uh, regarding Jesus. So uh, coming to chapter 7, uh, if we could have someone read out for us the first five verses. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Here in this, in these five verses, uh, we basically see Jesus' brothers mocking him, making fun of him. Um, they say that, you know, in a little place, it's easy to pretend that you are great. But 
when you go and drop shoulders with all the other big shots then the world will know whether you yourself are a big shot or not so in that sense you know they are saying to him uh, leave galilee and go to judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret so sitting here in a small place you can pretend to be god you can pretend to be uh, a mighty prophet but why don't you go over there to judea where all the big religious leaders are are they going to believe in you are they going to place their faith in you that will prove to us whether or not you really are the messiah so in that way they kind of mockingly speak to him uh, the reason that jesus is choosing to continue moving around in galilee and not go to judea is because by now plans are being made by the authorities to kill him so the conspiracy has now started uh, the the uh, the leaders are actually now strategizing on how exactly to uh, you know uh, kill jesus permanently so because jesus time has not yet come uh, the time for the crucifixion has not yet come jesus is delaying you know the uh, the his going and so he chooses to stay over here in galilee move around the towns which are there in galilee rather than going to judea so when they say why don't you go over there uh, he says that his time has not yet come we see that in the next few verses um that would be verses verse 6 onwards maybe we could read uh, from verse 6 all the way up to verse 13 verses 6 to 13 please then jesus said to them my time has not yet come but your time is always ready the world cannot hate you but it hates me because i testify of it that it works are evil you go up to this feast i am not at going up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come when he had said these things to them he reminded in he remained in Gal- galilee but when his brothers had gone up then he also went up to the feast not openly but as it were in secret then the jews sought him at the feast and said where is he and there was much complaining among the people concerning him some said he is good others said no on the contrary he deceives the people however no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. So here Jesus says, "My time has not yet fully come." So uh, the time has not yet come for an open, head-on clash with the religious leaders. Because once that happens, then the arrest will take place, and then the crucifixion will take place. So Jesus is waiting for the divine timetable for God to give him the signal, and only then he is willing to go over there uh, to Judea. so he he says he says to his brothers you go ahead because you can go at any time you know i mean uh, there's no calling upon their life uh, to you know save the entire world uh, so he says you can go any time but for for jesus there's a very set time table because he has been destined to save the entire world and so he needs to follow the timeline very carefully so he continues waiting in galilee and then once he gets permission from the father then he goes but again he does not go publicly he say it says he goes in secret which basically means that once he goes to jerusalem he does not stand in the you know in the in the open courtyards and start preaching he stays hidden he does not you know openly begin to preach and so the crowd is whispering and saying where is he is he going to come for the feast what's going to happen because they also have begun to hear rumors that plans are uh, you know uh, are being carried out for jesus um, killing so they are aware of it and so now the rumors are increasing so finally halfway through the feast uh, maybe after a few days that is when god gives him the permission to openly publicly start preaching and that we see verse 14 onwards uh, so verse 14 to verse 20 if you could read yeah 
now about the middle of the feast jesus went up into the temple and taught and the jews marveled saying how does this man know later having never studied jesus answered them and said my doctrine is not mine but his who sent me if anyone wants to do his will he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from god or whether i speak on my own authority he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him did not moses give you the law and yet none of you keeps the law why do you seek to kill me the people answered and said you have a demon who is seeking to kill you so halfway through the feast uh, jesus is finally given permission to publicly make himself known and uh, uh, so he comes into the temple courtyard and he begins to preach and it says there that the jews were amazed and they asked how did this man get such learning without having been taught um so the people who could really preach and teach very well were the pharisees and the sadducees because they would have gone to theological colleges they would have formally been trained uh, you know in the old testament scriptures so they would know the uh, the the detailed in depth explanation for every old testament passage they were the ones who will be able to clearly explain things but jesus never went to any of these um, to these uh, you know pharisee and sadducee leaders to get trained by them so they say how did this man get such learning without having been taught in fact you know if we if you remember when uh, the only kind of formal training that jesus gets is when he goes to the temple and he sits down over there as a child and asks the leaders you know certain doubts and clarifications which he wants so whatever main teaching and training has happened it has happened directly from the father he would sit with the scrolls in front of him and he would ask the father to explain those scrolls to him and the father has taught him the father has trained him only when he has some doubts which you know uh, he needs clarified he would go to some leaders and then the leaders would provide him details which he needs so jesus training takes place directly from the father and these people are amazed and they say how can this man speak like you know better than even the pharisees and the sadducees um and that is why jesus says in verse 16 my teaching is not my own it comes from the one who sent me he is the one who has taught me these things and now i am uh, conveying these truths to you you know is what jesus is saying over here and he goes on to say anyone who chooses to do the will of god will find out whether my teaching comes from god or whether i speak on my own so anyone who is genuinely interested in knowing the truth anyone who genuinely wants to hear the father and obey what the father is saying anyone who really wants to uh, to 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 know the details of you know what is being taught they will be able to hear the truth and they will be able to believe in jesus so even though throughout this gospel and on the other gospels people give a lot of excuses of why they cannot believe in jesus it basically comes down to one fundamental thing the people who had hardened their hearts who didn't really want to know the truth did not get the truth they could not catch the truth on the other hand those who have a desire to do the will of god they were able to hear what jesus was saying and they were able to believe and so jesus is, as jesus says over here you know you people go on talking about the law of moses and how important it is and how much you believe in it but he says those of you who claim that you believe in the law of moses you are not keeping the law of moses you are not obeying it that is what he says in verse 19 he says has not moses given you the law yet not one of you keeps the law why are you trying to kill me because moses very clearly said thou shall not murder in exodus chapter 20 so you know that's that is what moses taught and yet these people are getting ready to murder jesus and then uh, the the crowd it's uh, the, you know the the crowd the general crowd they say you must be demon possessed because why are you thinking that anyone wants to kill you 
but Jesus knows. He knows that the plans are already afoot. You know, already the conspiracy is being hatched. And uh, so Jesus basically is exposing the hypocrisy of these people who talk about how much they honor the law of Moses, how much they know the scriptures. But actually, when it comes down to it, in their heart, there is no desire to actually do the will of God. They'd rather not know the will of God because once they know it, they'll have to follow it. So they'd rather live in ignorance. That is the attitude of their hearts. And so Jesus exposes their hypocrisy over here. And then uh, he raises another argument. Uh, that would be in verses 21 to 24, if someone could read out. 21 to 24. John chapter 7, verse 21 to 24. Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. From the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circum circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So Jesus is scolding them regarding two things about the law of Moses. First, even though they claim to be following the law of Moses and they are not supposed to murder, they are hatching a conspiracy over here to kill Jesus. So that's the first uh, you know, accusation which Jesus makes. The second thing that he, the accusation he makes is regarding the working of miracles on the Sabbath day. So he says, I did one miracle and you're all amazed. Not amazed in a positive way, but rather in a negative way. They are you know, amazed that he would do a miracle on a Sabbath day. They're very, very horrified. So amazed in a negative sense. You know, so he says, I did one miracle and you're all amazed. You're very, very upset that I would do a miracle on the Sabbath day. But don't you people understand the, you know, what the Sabbath day is all about? So he goes on to say in verse 22, he says, look at the amount of importance you people give to the ceremony of circumcision. Um, because in uh, according to the law of Moses, why is physical circumcision done for the little baby boy? Uh, that is so that uh, this, this physical circumcision, it is a symbol. It has a spiritual meaning. The spiritual meaning is that it is indicating circumcision of the heart where all the evil in the heart is being cut out and thrown away. Okay, so physical circumcision was done because it had a spiritual meaning. It would mean that God would circumcise the heart of that person and then a person with a circumcised heart will be able to become a citizen of God's kingdom. The Jews were very proud of this, that they are citizens of God's heavenly kingdom. They regarded the rest of the Gentile world as pagans who will end up in hell. But they are the chosen people of Abraham, the children of Abraham. They have been given the ceremony of physical circumcision because it symbolizes the fact that God will circumcise their hearts and then they will get to become citizens of God's heavenly kingdom. So it's a very great privilege, you know. And so on the um, so on the eighth day after a little baby is born, if it is a boy, that child has to be circumcised on the eighth day. What if the eighth day is a Sabbath day? No problem. You know, they don't consider it work. So even if the eighth day is a Sabbath day, they will go ahead with the circumcision ceremony because it's something very, very important to them. That will symbolize the fact that now they have, they have been, that their little baby has been made into a citizen of God's kingdom. So Jesus says, you know, you give that much importance to that one little ceremony of circumcision, which involves one human organ. On the other hand, I heal an entire human human beings body from head to toe and you are so horrified that i'm doing it on the sabbath day what kind of double standards are you practicing over here is what jesus is basically saying so he you know he exposes their hypocrisy in these um in these verses and then um this is what the people begin to say we will see their response verse 25 onwards um 
maybe we can read from verse 25 up to verse 30 uh, verse 32 yeah 25 to 32 then some of them from jerusalem said is this not he whom they seek to kill but look he speaks bold, uh, boldly and they say nothing to him do the rules know indeed that this is truly that christ however we know where this man is from but when the christ comes no one knows where he is from then jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying you both know me and you know where I am from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know, but I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. And many of these, the people believed in him, and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than this which this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring, murmuring these things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. If you look at all these verses, you know, which even uh, um, which we have read even uh, so far, a lot of dialogue of the common crowd is mentioned over here. In other words, you know, John is trying to explain a lot of discussion was going on. So everyone was now thinking in their minds, do we believe in this Jesus or not? What is the decision that I should personally take regarding this Jesus? So a lot of people were beginning to ask this question. So slowly over a period of time, you know, God had arranged things in such a way that finally now in this last stages, everyone was talking about Jesus. Everyone was thinking in their minds about him. Everyone was getting an opportunity to hear the father and learn from the father. So those with open hearts, those who have a desire to do the will of God, those who are open to hear the truth, they will be able to hear. There will be a stirring in their spirit and they will be able to believe that this Jesus is the Messiah. But all those with superficial interest in spiritual things, all those with hardened hearts, they will not be able to hear. So things are now coming to a uh, climax. Everyone is talking, everyone is discussing, and there are two things mentioned over here. Some people are saying, look how boldly he's speaking. You know, he's, he's taking the, the law of Moses and nicely criticizing them using the law of Moses. And nobody is saying a word to him. Does this mean that the authorities are finally beginning to accept that he is the Messiah? It's one opinion. Another person says, no, no, no. How can this be the Messiah? Because when the Messiah comes, nobody will even know from where he comes. But that is actually not the truth, right? Because if you remember in, uh, in Matthew, when um, the wise men come to Herod and ask him, where is this king that you people are looking forward to? Because, you know, we saw in the star uh, that there is a king who's going to be born. Herod is very, very scared. He's very, very upset because, you know, he likes to be king. He doesn't want anyone else to become a rival king. And so then he consults with the chief priests. And the chief priests very clearly know from where the Messiah king will come. And so they, they uh, refer back to the prophecy which is there in Micah chapter 5 verses 2 and 4 and they clearly say this messiah king he will come from bethlehem in judea so this uh, person in the crowd who is saying we know where this man is from when the messiah comes no one will know where he is from that is actually wrong knowledge that's wrong information when the messiah comes it will be very clearly known from where he comes he will come from bethlehem in judea so there are different people saying different things. Um, and then in verse um, 30, it says, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Now God has got the attention of the crowds. 
the crowds are now beginning to think about spiritual things, about whether they should believe in this Messiah, whether he is the one who can grant them eternal life. So God is beginning to work in the hearts of people. He's preparing people for what is to come next. And so, because Jesus' hour has not yet come, they are unable to uh, you know, arrest him at this particular point. Um, and then Jesus, uh, yeah, then it says in verse 32 that they send the temple guards to arrest him. So the temple guards come there to officially, uh, you know, conduct an arrest. But then later on, we see that they go back empty handed without doing the arrest. And then they get a nice scolding from the leaders. We'll get, the, get to that later. Uh, but right now, maybe we can look at verses um, 33 to 34. Five, yeah, 33 to 35, if you can read out. Verse 33. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I'll go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does he intend to go that we shall not found, find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is this thing that he said? You will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. So Jesus says very plainly, a time will come, you know, when you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. And the people are wondering, where is he going to go to another land and start preaching over there? Is that why we will not be able to find him? But actually, Jesus is referring to what he had earlier said in Capernaum, you know, where he very openly says, does this offend you? And, you know, when he says that he's the bread from heaven, they get very offended. And then uh, Jesus says, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? So basically, Jesus is saying over here, a day will come when I will ascend back to the Father and then you will have to believe because with your own eyes, you will see me ascending into heaven, back to where I came from. So that is basically what Jesus is referring to. So now he's very, very openly declaring his divinity, very openly he's uh, inviting people to come and believe in him. And uh, so he makes his invitation here in these verses, verse 37 onwards. Um these are considered rather important verses because this is one of the final invitations which Jesus is going to be giving, you know, before his arrest. Uh, so, um, yeah, if we could read out verse 37 onwards, um, all the way up to verse 45. Yeah. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus should then cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard the saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them want to take him, but none laid hand on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees, who said to them, Why have you not brought him? So halfway through the feast, Jesus begins to openly preach and people uh, start discussing among themselves whether or not they should believe in him. And now you come to the last and greatest day of the festival when Jesus gives his invitation again. And he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And he goes on to say, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And of course, he is referring over here to the Holy Spirit, who would be given later, um, after Jesus has been glorified. Uh, so, in um, uh, we see two things over here. 
First, Jesus says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. So anyone who goes to Jesus and drinks from him, their own thirst will be quenched. But then after their thirst gets quenched, something more happens for them. Rivers of living water will flow from within them even to others in the sense now they will become enabled, equipped to start sharing about Jesus with other people so that other people also can be blessed, so that other people's thirst also can be quenched. So the greatness about what Jesus does for, that, for us is that when we go to him, first he quenches our thirst. He satisfies our hunger. We taste who he is. We get to learn what we can get you know, from him when we place ourselves under him and learn from him and uh, follow him. We begin to taste what that kind of life is. And once we taste it, we are eager to go and share it with other people. The joy that we are experiencing, the satisfaction which we are now you know, having, we want others to have it too. So the waters within don't just stay within. They literally begin to overflow and there's this longing to go and share this with other people as well. So um, this is what Jesus promises to anyone who comes to him. Not only will their thirst be quenched, but Jesus will equip them in such a way that they will become people who will carry this water to others and other people's thirst also will be quenched. I mean, imagine if all of us could see ourselves in that way. We usually just are, you know, see ourselves as recipients. We want to receive, we want to receive. We want um, our, uh, you know, needs to be met. We want to be blessed. We want our thirst to be removed each day. We want our hunger to be satisfied. But we are uh, not allowing the waters to flow from within us, uh, you know, to others. So we are not allowing that outward flow to take place. Why? What is restricting it? What is stopping it? Why do we stop at that you know, initial point of just having our own hunger uh, satisfied? Maybe it's because we have not yet drunk enough, not yet eaten enough. A person who is fully satisfied will be so excited about what they have received, they will not be able to hold it in. They will, they will automatically go and share it with others. So the reason that a lot of believers are not going out and sharing with others is because they are, first of all, in a malnutrition state themselves. They have not truly you know, connected with him. What did we talk about true worshippers earlier? They are the ones who worship him in spirit and in truth. Those who have connected with him at that deep level, they are filled, they are satisfied, and they are so excited about what they, what they have received, they are eager to go and share it with others. You will automatically see that in your life. You know, we can apply it to even um, normal everyday things. You know, you, you, you go to a sale where the discounts are really good, do you come back home and just keep quiet? You automatically WhatsApp at least 10 of your close friends and tell them, please go there. The discounts over there are excellent. They are really selling the best products. You want to share the good news with others so that others also can enjoy. A lot of believers are not excited about eternal things because they are still in a very malnutritioned condition. If we can worship him in spirit and in truth you know the in the way we discussed in the earlier class we will be so satisfied that we will be we will want to share it with others because i've noticed this happening with me when i catch hold of some spiritual truth which really makes a difference in my life i immediately go and tell other people about it because i want them to enjoy what i experienced so that is the beauty about what the Lord can offer us. Let us be people who will go into his presence and say, Lord, there's something very wrong with me. I don't seem to be hungry for you. Lord, if you can just work in me and 
unclog all the things which are clogging me up on the inside through your holy spirit then lord i will be able to really receive from you absorb what you have to say and then i'll be so excited about what i have received i will want to go and share it at least with another dozen people so let's ask him for that we don't we might be in a state where we are you know have no appetite but we don't have to stay that way we can go to him and say lord you clean up whatever is there on the inside whatever is clogged up so that i will have this hunger and then i will really genuinely want to go and share what i am receiving with other people as well okay so it's so important what jesus is saying over here a person who goes to him should not just simply have their thirst quenched and stop there that waters within them becomes like a flowing river and it flows out to other people through them that is the way a believer's life should be working if that is not happening then you need to find out what is clogging up the you know the the channel why is the water not flowing out why is that eagerness not there so we would need to uh, you know uh, correct those deficiencies which may be there and so um here uh, you know uh, the people after hearing what jesus is saying uh, they say surely this is this man is the prophet he is the messiah uh, and uh, uh, then in verse 44 it says some wanted to seize him but no one laid a hand on him verse 45 finally the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the pharisees who asked them why didn't you bring him in so the guards went they heard jesus speaking they heard jesus invitation they saw the way the people responded to the powerful words coming out of his mouth after seeing all of this they were not very sure whether this person should be arrested whether he has ever done anything that deserves arresting and so they go back empty handed and the pharisees ask them why didn't you bring him in and this is the response which they give uh, so maybe if we could read uh, from verse 46 um yeah and then we could go all the way up to verse 52 yeah verse 56 the officers answered no man ever spoke like this man then the pharisees answered them are you also deceived have any of the rulers or the pharisees believed in him but this crowd that does not know the law is accursed nicodemus who who came to jesus by night being one of them said to them does our lord judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing they answered and said to him are you also from galilee search and look for the prophet has arisen out of galilee and everyone went to his own. so here um the guards they reply and they say no one ever spoke the way this man does so even they were convicted in their hearts when they heard the words which jesus was speaking um and then the, this upsets the pharisees very much and they say have any of the rulers or the pharisees believed in him you know we are the learned ones we are the ones who know the old testament inside out so have we been convinced by this jesus no definitely not it's only the mob which really doesn't know the old testament scriptures they are the ones who are believing in this jesus we who know the old testament we are not at all convinced so you see they had hardened their hearts so much that is why jesus says to them you talk about the law of moses and how much you respect it but you people are not following what moses said about me you know so um, these people the rulers and the pharisees have chosen to harden their hearts on the other hand the mob the mob which maybe really does not know the old testament scriptures that well they because of the openness in their heart because they have a desire to do god's will because of that desire which is there in them they are are getting stirred in their spirit to believe in what they have heard so we see that it's not intellectual knowledge which brings a person closer to god it is that um openness in the spirit to receive what god is offering intellectual knowledge helps it maybe enables us to understand certain concepts better 
to be able to maybe grasp a doctrine at, at a deeper level. So yes, intellectual knowledge is good. But more than intellectual knowledge, it's that openness which is there in your spirit. That eagerness to know spiritual things, that hunger for spiritual things, that is much more important. The unlearned mob, some of the people in the mob had that. So you can sit here for you know three years of Bible college, but if you don't have that hunger and that eagerness, you'll walk away with intellectual knowledge having gained nothing. Don't let that happen to any of you, you know. So let that hunger and that eagerness be there on the inside because then you will hear and you will not be like this Pharisees who said so proudly, have any of us rulers or Pharisees believed in him? No, is what they say. However, among them, there is a man, Nicodemus, who has believed. And so he speaks up on behalf of Jesus and he says, how can we condemn him without even first allowing him to speak for himself? So, you know, they, he says, let us first bring him in, let him give his side of the, you know, uh, story, and then maybe we should condemn him. And because Nicodemus speaks in favor of Jesus, they are very, very upset. And they, they basically um, use a curse word in the sense they say, oh, what, you're from Galilee, is it? Because to be called a Galilean is like a really bad curse. Uh, you know, so they say, what, you're a, you're a Galilean, is it? Are you, an, are you an ignorant person like those people? Is that why you're supporting Jesus? In fact, don't you know, no prophet ever came from Galilee. But again, they get it wrong because Jonah definitely does come from Galilee. Maybe we can actually read that. Second Kings chapter 14, verse 25, if someone could read out. Second Kings chapter 14, verse 25. He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the sea of the uh, Arab, Araba, according to the word of the Lord, God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Geth, Apple. This place, Gath Hefer, is basically about three miles north of Nazareth. It's very much in Galilee. So yes, a prophet definitely did come from Galilee. Okay, uh, he, And so the Pharisees who should have actually known that were ignorant of this particular fact in this case. Uh, so yes, um, we, we've covered the portion for today. Um, so unless anyone has any comments or any questions, you know, we can close with a word of prayer. Nothing, right? So, in that case, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, in these two chapters which we have covered today, again and again, uh, Jesus speaks of spiritual things, but we see the people stuck at the material level where they only can think of material things. We pray, O oh Lord, that that would not happen to us, especially uh, those of us who are students of a Bible college and who have come to study the Bible. We have not come to gain an intellectual knowledge of the Bible, O oh Lord, but to have the word speak to us deep in our spirits so that we may become full of spirit and life, just like you said. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we would not make the mistake which the people made in these two chapters, but we would be people who are open and eager and hungry, because if we are hungry, you will fulfill our hunger. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we will be people who are so satisfied of our hunger and so quenched of our thirst that we will be eager to go and quench the thirst of every thirsty person out there, O oh Lord. We pray that you would um, work in us in that manner so that we overflow with the living waters and we are able to reach out to others and be a blessing to them. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would do a mighty work of the Holy Spirit in each one of us who is part of this class. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.